So hello, everybody, except greetings from the Czech Republic. Uh, my name is Veronika Nierbergova, and I come from Palacki University in Olomouc, Faculty of Education and Department of Art Education. And apart from being a PhD student, uh, I also work as a teacher at basic school, faculty basic school of Charles University in Prague. And it's my passion to lead people mainly pupils, to gain new knowledge, to find out something new. Uh, I do it with various projects, which are um, somehow connected to cultural heritage mediation. In my PhD research, I tried to ask all the basic schools in my country to participate in a questionnaire survey uh, to found out how they mediate culture heritage to pupils. Based on the answers, I've chosen 20 schools all around the Czech Republic, and I visited these school, schools during the previous school year, and I tried to find out how teachers work with their pupils concerning culture heritage mediation. The results are going to be published in a methodological portfolio, uh, which is meant to be uh, like an insp inspiration for other teachers, and it should summarize examples of good practice. I also do other projects, such as interactive guides through uh, the regional sites. It is based on GPS, uh, it gives immediate feedback, and uh, during my PhD research, actually, I found, that, found out that some schools really used my uh, interactive guides, which was very pleasant to find it out. Well, I could speak about my PhD research or GPS-based projects for uh, more time in more detail. However, I was speaking about these things uh, at different conferences. So today, I mentioned this just to create a background for what I'm going to speak about now, which is my own artistic project that I called Whispering. It is somehow connected also to education and culture heritage. It is a collection of about 40 paintings. Some of them are quite small, others are quite large. They are acrylic or oil paintings, and I always say that it is like a visual chronicle of my life, because each of these paintings is accompanied with a short story, and in these stories I combine my own memories with some significant historic events, such as, as you can see, this is my birth house, and in the story I speak also about the local floods in 1997, which were really huge. Or uh, sometimes I combine my own stories, uh, such as my trips, bicycle trips, or trips to other countries. Here you can see Svalbard and Madeira. And I combine my own stories, my own memories, with the local uh, history and features of the local, of the regional culture. Uh, well, uh, some of these pictures are really very important part of exhibitions and workshops. Uh, and very important is also the goal. You can ask what is the goal of this continuously enlarging collection. It is to make people think, to make them think about their own special places, places that are somehow significant to them because each of us, each person, each story, somehow contributes to the regional, or maybe national, or worldwide history and culture. And this is the goal of my artistic work. Painting for people is the motto uh, that I use, and it should show that I use visually understandable language, language in which I can communicate with the audience and uh, they understand, they accept what I'm going to tell them. Uh, I had the chance to have 
some exhibitions and workshops with young as well as elderly people. And it was a great chance to observe their reactions because it was very important for them. They give me positive feedback, so I'm going to continue. Uh, some of the parts of the collection were also awarded. First day in Prague, it was a competition called Here I Live, Here My Home Is. And then, for example, in Novi Sad in Serbia, it was competition about art for non-violent life. Uh, the exhibitions are always based on the same collection, more or less, but always I try to find out something new, a new workshop or new context of the whole exhibition, so that it is interesting for the audience. Well, uh, because we are coming to the end of my presentation, and I know I have given you quite a lot of information, so let's summarize my past 400 seconds here. Uh, in my academic life, I am somehow involved in cultural heritage mediation, mainly to learners of the primary school, schools, and I try to use different ways to do that. So, for example, as you can see, you could see my own artistic project, and it is not, I would say, with a particularly scientific context, but still I try to emphasize uh, the educational potential of cultural heritage. So thank you very much for your attention. If you have any idea for improvements or extension, I will be glad if you contact me. So thank you, and that's all from me. Goodbye. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I, I would like to uh, tell you a few words about uh, my PhD thesis, which is focused on uh, guerrilla uh, spontaneous interventions in public spaces, uh, uh, which I uh, did uh, as an artwork for PhD. Uh, few words about my uh, previous experiences. I uh, am a part of Design Studio, uh, Studio Now, and uh, for many years I've been working on public space uh, designs with, with my colleague Magda Szwajcowska, uh, which is also here. Uh, as you can see, they are focused on, on the same uh, issues as, uh, as written in my uh, title of the, of the PhD thesis. So we are, we are mainly working with the abandoned public spaces and trying to find uh, simple, uh, easy to implement solutions for, uh, for such uh, places. Counter doesn't work, I think. Okay. Uh, yeah, and during my research work, uh, I also analyzed a lot of different examples and a lot of different uh, methodologies and uh, approaches to this kind of uh, works. Uh, some of them are more artistic, some of them are only to inspire you to, uh, to behave properly on, on uh, a way with the public space, some of them are more practical. During the PhD studies I was uh, involved in um, research and education projects. We did some uh, uh, exhibitions for about the empathy because I believe that empathy and observation is very important to do those kind of uh, interventions properly. And the first uh, artwork were focused around the research, how to prepare very basic element of public space, which is the bench, uh, in a different ways, how we can prepare the bench without uh, special knowledge and uh, in low cost uh, ways. Uh, so. Some, I will show you a few, few projects. One of them was uh, made for the exhibition, and this is the, the um, bench which is based on um, elements which are not in very simple way connected with, uh, with public space, with ar architecture and design, uh, so they are inspired by, by also other disciplines, and I was researching and searching in, in many different uh, disciplines. Also here you can see other, other approach when you can see this, this bench which is made completely from OSB, uh, cheap uh, wooden based material, um, and then something completely different made from sewage pipes 
which also works as a, as a bench. So as you can see, I was uh, looking in uh, different disciplines and different approaches here. I was focused on modularity and, and giving the answer to the proper ergonomical ways to, to those elements works as a, as a bench. To, to now to tell you a few words about the process itself, I was making after those experiments with the benches, I was uh, creating artworks like guerrilla street art works uh, around the city during uh, the ninth May mainly, and I was f uh, showing, trying to find simple answers to, to observed uh, problems with the space. So now I will show you a few examples. As you can see here, these are some abundant uh, walls in the courtyard with no uh, function and no purposes. Only some graffiti artists, if I you can say them, if we can call them so, were working on it. So I thought about very simple solution just to show, uh, just to draw a rectangle which has simple connections with the um, football court and uh, just to show the possibility of the space that it can work in a different way and we can use it as it is only with some very small interventions. Other example is uh, taken from the public space, which we have a lot of this kind of abundant infrastructural elements uh, in the public space, which has now no function, or even if they have some function, they are not used by the, by the citizens. So then, after analyzing the dimensions and, and basics of this element, I thought that it's enough to be as, uh, to function as a table, we need only to put a tablecloth on it, so as you can see, sometimes it's all about the inspiration and only showing that it's already there and that it can have another function. Also here, the example of the abundant uh, volleyball court, uh, the huge green space which now uh, has completely no function, but still there are some elements of infrastructure which inspired me somehow to deal with it. Uh, and as you can uh, see now, this is something like the open form design, uh, again with those sewing pipes, which can give you some uh, uh, look as, as a, some sort of animal or dinosaur, and you can treat it as a playground uh, around this element. Other problem which I also observed with the public space is the, the fencing now, which, which is favorite uh, work of developers when it comes to the residential areas. And for me, it's also an issue with the public space because public space should be uh, in general accessible. So what I have done is just to put the ladder there and to give the, uh, and to give the access again to this, uh, to this for me, open space, open public space, which it should be. And of course, what is the important aspect, I don't want to uh, damage anything. I don't have, uh, uh, of course, any permissions for it. So, so now uh, this was the solution. The other thing which I have observed is also about the exclu uh, exclusivity of the city, that there is a lot of different participants, which we, in many cases, don't see. Here you can see the, the homeless uh, man uh, sleeping on the, on the bench. So I thought about, again, simple solution that to make it for him a little bit more comfortable, we can add to the bench uh, a pillow. So now it, has more, it is more functional than it was before. It's not only for sitting. And it's also the design which shows more on uh, each focused on, on showing that uh, there are more people in the city that we are thinking about in the days. The, and the final work which I uh, uh, have finished is the zine, which is a, some sort of instruction how to work uh, with the public space for anyone who would like to prepare any of the intervention. The final quote uh, only uh, which inspired me in my works is a uh, quote from the Enzo Mari Autopregazione book uh, that everyone uh, must design. This is the only way to avoid being designed. Thank you.
presentation will be about my experience as a graphic designer and illustrator while creating books um, and their interaction and transformation into other formats. I'm interested in how and why the visual material that lends itself to the book format becomes adaptable to other media. In the field of book design, I noticed the principle of visual ecology, the transfer of the same visual idea from one medium to another. This phenomenon once again confirms how capacious and universal the material body of the book is, as the qualitatively constructed visual content of the book is easily adapted to other formats. The ecology of images is especially important in our image-saturated modernity. When people are getting tired of visual information overload, I believe that recycling and repurposing images is valuable and relevant practice. In 2017, I created my master's project, Installation, Video and Book Summa. The visual content of the book reflected and satirized the issues of the illustrator's drawing trends discussed in the theoretical part of the project. The visual content of the book the later dictated the guidelines for the massive visual communication of a large format event. Bologna Children's Book Fair, uh, 2020 Identity. I developed this uh, identity with the Italian studio Kialab. And after a workshop, it was a mutual decision to go back to the book's Summa illustrations uh, because uh, it had visual width and was able to withstand the challenges of a mass event space. In developing the identity of the fair, the focus shifted from the book to large scale spaces. And recently in 23, after a collaboration with PhD candidates in Lithuania, Academy of Music and Theatre, the illustrations of my book Home were adapted for the theater performance, which was built uh, with the element of book design as a starting point rather than the text. This case shows how the visual content of a book design not have to end in the format of a publication, but can use its potential to grow into dimensional spaces, into three-dimensional spaces. This, for example, a set design and the costume details of the actors. The visual field is not polluted as the qualit qualitatively shaped visual content of the book spreads into new spaces. Maybe it's a way of non-stop vitality in creative process. Vitality is also important in my dissertation, wild expression in the field of visual communication design. Inspired by the theater crew, creative process with visual content, I started the process of embodied sketching. I went into experience in my own body what it means to create a character, its environment, without a specific plan, based on intuition, more like tacit knowledge, bodily knowledge. I looked for unexpected sources of inspiration, such as using leftovers from past projects or scanning a plastic bag to find a unique visual language. In this case, the idea of plastic ecology merged with visual one. And also, collective experience, as in performing arts, is important to me. So at the International uh, Bologna Children's Book Fair, I led a visual decompression workshop, aiming for a collective experience of visual procrastination, which we mostly experience alone. And uh, Visual procrastination is the starting point of my dissertation. Fortunately, in 2020, I visited an exhibition in Rome, Scribbling and Doodling from Leonardo da Vinci to Sid Wombly, where the interest in visual procrastination and conscious writing and scribbling has taken on international relevance by the curators. The aim of the exhibition was to show how the drawing, made without respecting the rules of art, clumsily, if by as if by an untrained hand, with a playful subtext, with the aim of irritating someone like caricatures, or with the aim of visualizing distracting thoughts, visual procrastination has actually been present in artistic creativity from the Renaissance to the present day. I was most impressed by the ceramic jugs engraved in 19th century by inmates of La Nuova Prison in Turin. 
the prisoners gave an additional meaning to the water vessel, visual communication. I was also interested in caricatures by French painter and sculptor Jean Dubuffet. In his exhibition catalog called People are much more beautiful than they think, celebrate their true figure. The Italian word caricare translates to charge, to load. The aim of the caricature was to capture the essential, most striking feature of the human being and to hyperbolize it even more, to draw with a humor. In caricatures, recognizability depends on the energy conveyed for the line and the purposeful, suggestive deformation that emphasizes the person's distinctive features. The impressions of exhibition in Rome inspired my solo exhibition, Book Doodling Camel, at Vilnius Academy of Arts, Exhibition Space 5 Mills. Well, I presented my published books and visual procrastinations in between making them. While using the principle of participatory design, together with PhD students, we have created a work in exhibition space, an analogy of the research process, a camel. For me, it was a challenge to present my design process in a different workshop-based format. I jokingly depicted my research process as a camel. My camel has no head and no tail. It is a never-ending, moving, hilly road on which I hope not to create a visual pollution, but to ecologically translate what I have already created into new media. So the exit process is continuous and always fluid. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is David. I'm a PhD candidate and a ceramic artist. Um, for about 20 years now, uh, I work with the potter's wheel. This is my favorite tool, uh, but I, I use it not, all, not always in a traditional way. Um, sometimes I host a ceramic competition, pottery competition for the students, and they have to uh, throw the highest possible cylinder, uh, and then, well, uh, throw it again. Uh, so it's a game based on the double meaning of word throw. Um, I also wanted to become a very first ceramic artist in space, so like a multi-planetary artist, you could say. And that's why I built this wooden construction, uh, and I put my wheel on top of it, upside down, uh, and then I, I, I practice and, and I practice throwing in a, in a reverse uh, gravity. So I know, I know it's, it's not the same as zero gravity in space or like lower than Earth uh, gravity uh, on other planets like Mars, but uh, this is the closest I can get uh, to, to, to practice and be ready for, for that opportunity that I'll hopefully uh, will come. Um, so there's one uh, advantage uh, when it comes to throwing upside down, it is pulling the, the clay, so it, it stretches almost by itself. I just have to keep the, keep the shape and keep it together. Uh, but that's all uh, when it comes to advantages. Uh, well, the le list of disadvantages is actually quite long. Uh, for example, watering the clay is almost impossible. Like everything is covered with mud, uh, but uh, the clay is almost, almost dry completely uh, when, I, when I touch it. Uh, another thing is that I have to have to use the ladder uh, to adjust myself instead of adjusting the clay. Uh, another challenge would be uh, control of the speed uh, of, of this wheel. So I have to do it with my hands, like normally I, I would use my use my feet, uh, but here I would lose the completely lose the stability. And the uh, last final thing is that when the clay is stretching like that, it tears apart somewhere, somewhere in the middle, uh, most likely. Like here you can see that uh, it's, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> it tears apart. So I had to cut it clean um, uh, to use the, the rest of it. And uh, yeah, this is probably my favorite moment, uh, like a favorite frame, uh, where it's uh, almost like, uh, in space, 
Like uh, that, that's how I see it. If, if I would uh, ever uh, get the chance to throw in space, uh, I would probably uh, would be uh, uh, surrounded by those simple shapes floating around me. Uh, now, on getting back on Earth, when it's finally uh, on, on, a, on a bottom, uh, it deforms uh, in a very uh, specific and a unique way. And that's also uh, very interesting for me. So uh, I use this con construction in a four separate ways. So first, obviously, it's this practice before I go in the space. Uh, 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 the other thing is I, I use it as a performance. So here you can see me at a high temperature festival this year. Um, this is like another very specific and very funny situation when I get uh, so many questions like what kind of a glue I use to stick the clay uh, at the upside down wheel. Um, I, another thing is those uh, drawings behind the ladder. Uh, this is uh, how I record each attempt. And the very last thing, and probably my favorite one, is the sculptures that I can, uh, I can made with this very specific deformation. Uh, here you can see the close-up and uh, some, of the, some of the pieces that I, I made with this. Um, so this, this is part of the series uh, Black Holes. Um, we still don't know how they look like or what's inside of the black, real black holes, but this is my, my ideas. Uh, so I also use ceramic glazes to cover the, uh, the, the, the surface um, and to kind of uh, show the cosmos of, uh, of, of those glazes on, on, on the surface of it. And um, yeah, with the, with the last frame, uh, I would like to invite you um, to join me uh, at 2 o'clock today uh, for uh, closing my uh, exhibition, uh, Dimensions Untwined. It's mostly about my inspiration uh, coming from string uh, theory. Uh, thank you. So hello everyone, my name is Ignaz, I'm a composer and music producer, and I want to tell you a few things about my PhD project, which is my first symphony, and as the title said, electroacoustic coherence in this, in this specific uh, piece. Let's wait for another frame. Here it is. So the traditional symphony orchestra developed at the court of the Elector of the Palatinate in Mannheim in the mid 18th century. The basis of the orchestra was an ensemble of string instruments like uh, first violin, second violin, viola, and cello, doubled by double basses, as you can see on the front of this uh, picture. The symphony orchestra uh, has never achieved a fixed composition. Its configuration and size is subject to constant change although there is a certain standard reaching an average of about uh, 100 people, sufficient for the performance of 19, most of 19th and 20th century repertoire, is divided into a section of woodwinds, brass, percussion, keys, and strings. The symphony orchestra is usually arranged in the same way with minor changes depending on the needs of the composition. Strings forms the base of the ensemble, followed by woodwinds, then the brass, and at the very end of the stage, the percussion. The harp and an additional piano are usually positioned on the left side of the stage. In the production of contemporary symphonic music, such as film score or video game, video game music, for instance, the standard orchestra panning is always meant to be as close as possible to the live psychoacoustic experience, taking into the account the hyperrealism involved in the use of electronics, for instance. We try to sort of emulate the acoustic aspects of the live orchestra performance. Music production being such an important skill of the modern composer is guided by slightly different rules of panning. In the pop rock band production, high sounding instruments such as synthesizers, pads, etc., are stereo panned, which means that they are on the left and right sides of the listener's head if you're using headphones. Low sounding instruments such as kick and more importantly the bass 
I always centered. What if we transferred this technique to the arrangement of the symphony orchestra and shattered the existing scheme? For instance, move low sounding instruments such as tuba, cellos, double basses to the center of the stage and place high and medium sound instruments such as flute, trumpet or French horn in the panorama. We will then probably obtain a balance close to the quality of CD recording. So wanting to take the advantage of the tools I used to produce theater and film music, which are virtual instruments and MIDI controllers, and transfer production techniques to the symphonic language, I've come up with the orchestra of layers, referring to the popular layering technique of duplicating the same part in multiple instruments to achieve a fuller or richer sound, if you will. These are some of the special instruments I use that are MIDI controllers, which are responsible for controlling virtual instruments and sound filtering parameters. You can see standard keyboards with some weird knobs and faders that allow integration with a computer program containing all the information about virtual instruments. Drum pad allows you to make the electronic sounds while playing still traditional percussion, percussion technique. So the notation of such instruments in traditional score becomes a bit problematic. It's not enough to notate the usual notes, but to sort of indicate the handling of other parameters of sound which are the electronic instruments, obviously. Here you can see the way I found to notate drum pad. I replaced the usual note heads with the sign of the pad that should be struck. For instance, P1 means to hit pad one. You can also see a simple rhythmic group notated traditionally uh, and in the form of drum pad notation. So you can see the traditional note heads and the note heads I've come up with to notate this weird instrument. Notating a MIDI keyboard is a bit problematic. This is because the pianist has to get used to the new notation of traditional keyboard. In addition to the piano stave, he has also observed a number of filters that require manipulation such as volume, modulation wheel, and effect channel. These parts in my PhD composition are, are not sonically complex, but strongly enhanced in the colors of sound. The another layer in my vision of the modern orchestra is named in the tradition of 20th century music, the tape. So it's simply an audio track that supports the orchestra with pre-programmed specific drone, which sounds or rhythmic uh, configurations, if you will. What I wanted to achieve using the audio track is to somehow enlarge the sound of uh, orchestra spectrum and the spectrum of the whole ensemble. In keeping with the theme of my uh, PhD dissertation, the sounds in the audio track relate to the three different visions of the future, which is the thematic base of my doctoral composition, the first symphony. Here you can see how I notate the audio track in the score. This is a graphical, graphical visualization of a waveform or envelope of sound that you may be familiar with, uh, this visualization is intended to help the conductor know which audio file, uh, file is currently playing and whether the orchestra parts agrees with the audio. Since I work as a theater music composer quite often, uh, I also try to somehow include theatrical or performance elements, if you will, in my composition. The musicians in my score somehow become actors by performing certain gestures. Here you can see some examples of theatrical gestures. For example, theatrical preparation of an instrument for playing or putting the instrument away. Once again, the traditional note heads have been turned into specific symbols that give musicians clues as to what gesture to make. <clears throat> These two um, different axes suggest two different gestures. The first one consists of making a soundless movement similar to, for, for instance, playing a violin or the other instruments. The second one, though, involves um, what I called freezing in stillness, which is pretty theatrical gesture that um, creates a sort of illusion that orchestra is playing, but they freeze. In my PhD composition, in addition to the orchestra of layers that I mentioned earlier, uh, I also use a mixed choir. And because first movement of the symphony is inspired by the horror film dialogy titled A Quiet Place, you may be familiar with, I try to map out selected scenes with specific performance techniques. For example, the shouting of the female part of the choir referring to a childbirth scene. I wish I could have more time to tell you about other techniques, but I'm open to 
talk to those who are interested in my project. And thank you for attention. Uh, so hi there, uh, I've got a question to Michał Majewski, and thank you for your inspiring presentation. Um, the question is inspired by your uh, artwork where you um, put the ladder over the, the fence. And uh, the very question, have you considered uh, provoking the developer's reaction as an artistic means of expression as well? Like to invite developers um, for, uh, as a participant of the artwork. Uh, interesting uh, idea. Uh, do, do you mean that uh, I should like uh, invite them uh, to the place while I'm installing the... Uh, well, uh, I, I was... Um, so like struck, the performance somehow. Mm -hmm. yeah? I, I was struck um, by your definition of, well, public space, that it really should be open, right, uh, without those fences running um, around the, uh, the new um, apartment buildings, which I, which I really like and do agree with, um, so that your artwork and, and your um, philosophy behind your uh, art uh, is very, well, social based, uh, socially engaged in a way. Um, and, uh, mm, well, as a viewer, or as a participant of your art uh, work, uh, I just wondered what would happen if, from, no, from the side of the, from the perspective of the developer, maybe they do hold different definition of a public space. So I bought this very ground, it's yes. mine, you cannot pl place a ladder in here. Uh, so I can see some very, well, mm, inspiring moment for maybe a dialogue or uh, seeing uh, their reaction and uh, just introducing it to your art, just as a viewer. Uh, okay, so, so the, the, the answer could be very uh, uh, long, probably uh, long, so, so long as the, as the presentation was, but uh, uh, to make it shortly, first of all, there is a context behind this project. There was no time to, to, uh, to tell you more about it. But in general, it was a public space for 40, 50 years. They are not so new, those residential buildings, which are behind this fence. So, and I was like, as a child, was playing there. So there is something like more uh, personal behind this project. But uh, so they fenced the uh, whole area without a good reason, because the, the, behind the developers, they are reason, uh, the reason behind the, uh, it is that it provides safety. But here we had like 40 years of experience that there is no need to provide safety there because this is a safety environment. So there is no good reason to put the fence exactly in this place. So, so mm -hmm. the context is, um, is specific Absolutely, there. I get it. My but question referred to like new, newer architecture. Yeah, new and, and about the developers itself, like, to be honest, uh, maybe it's controversial, but I am the, the graduate architect, so I have some experiences with the developers. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, I don't believe that we can educate them somehow. I think they are so focused on money to be honest businessman perspective yeah and to, on business perspective that it's hard to focus uh, to to convince them to anything but as a society we have some influence and we can for example force some changes so the idea behind the project is also to inspire maybe not developers but more to inspire the citizens to do some actions which will force developers to change the uh, to change the, the, the thinking, yeah? so, so maybe I believe more in this way that, that we as a society mm -hmm. has a real influence and a real impact to the, to the space so that we can more uh, convince someone to, to the owners, let's say, because the ownership is also, is also a real uh, subject here uh, and also what is a public space. It's like uh, the society is, is, are the, is a keeper of the open uh, character of the public space. Yes, I, I believe in it, yes. Uh, uh, 
Good afternoon. Thanks very much to you all for your presentations. I really enjoyed them. Um, I have a question for David Junda. I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce that very well. <laughs> uh, I, oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm afraid I don't know anything about um, ceramics, but I enjoyed your presentation enormously. Um, I loved the final sculptural result, and I enjoyed the sort of performance bit of it as well. And I just wondered, you were very focused on um, doing it upside down, um, and I loved the idea of doing it in space, but obviously that's to try and mock up a, a spatial situation would be extremely costly. Um, and I just wondered if, if you had been subverting the conventional, hacking the conventional way of throwing a, a pot in any other ways, um, and what the implications of that was, if you, if you have a, if you can briefly sort of share that with us, I'd be really interested to know. Um, uh, help me to understand. Uh, you mean if I try in any other different ways than yeah, than any this? other different ways yeah. to do it in a in a funny well, fashion? Well, that would be a, a bit of a of a spoiler, but um, I I do have a plan to try next year to throw under the water. I so was going to mention that yeah. because that's obviously <laughs> where space people train a bit. But then I thought that's a stupid question to ask because <laughs> when it just turned to mush. <laughs> But that's why, I, as I say, I don't know anything about ceramics. So my idea is to use a um, container filled with oil, for example, and, and this way it, it won't dissolve that fast. So I, I could try at least to, uh, to, to pull some, some sort of a cylinder basic shape. Uh, yeah, that's, that's exactly the, the, the main inspiration was the, the training for, for astronauts. Uh, I, I've heard about it. That they, uh, they, they, they use uh, pools to, uh, to sort of... Uh, uh, and one day when you're a rich su and successful artist, you'll be able to afford to go up in that incredible vomit comet, as they call it, the free-falling <laughs> jumbo jet, and you can throw a pot in there. That'd be absolutely amazing. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks. Well, <laughs> actually, uh, yeah, I'm waiting until they will contact me. It's always better this way, you know. <laughs> yeah, but uh, honestly, uh, yeah, that that's uh, some. Yeah, somehow it, this is my plan. I'm just worried how my mum will react uh, <laughs> if somehow they they let me go. <laughs> yeah. Two short uh, questions uh, to Veronika Nürnbergova. Uh, uh, thank you for this przednaszka. Uh, uh, my otaska is, have you ever uh, uh, tried to reach the uh, people, handicapped people? Because I suppose that this kind of projects may well be adapted to such. Uh, and if you are interested in, I can give you some contacts in Kraków, Poland, Polsko, and maybe we can, I have some uh, tiny experience in, in, in going with music to uh, blind people like that. So I suppose that what you uh, uh, propose is maybe adapted to such uh, tasks. And one more question is to, to Mr. Wojciechowski, maybe later. Oh. Hello. <laughs> Thank you very much for your question and comment. Uh, and the answer is very short, no, I haven't tried, but I maybe I would like to try, so we no. can... Very short, it. not yet. Not yet, yeah. <laughs> and Maestro Wojciechowski, my question is, is it possible to listen to your uh, uh, pieces uh, when anywhere? Uh, obviously, <laughs> yeah, thank you for, for the question. Uh, not this one that I wanted to present you because it's still in developing, but uh, we have planned to, to perform my previous one when I started this whole idea of the Orchestra of Layers, which is combining the electronic instruments and MIDI controllers with the traditional symphonic orchestra. Next year, probably, fingers crossed, which is um, my mm, uh, master's degree uh, score, the Oratorio of the Resurrection, inspired by uh, a short of the, the the gospel part from from the Saint Matthew uh, for orchestra of layers, mixed choir and four soloists. So it's sort of uh, singing 
you know, partially singing and, and mostly instrumental oratorio uh, about long, about an hour. Uh, Could you long. provide some links, uh, electronic links to some pieces of you to the participants of this conference? Yeah, sure. Maybe after this, uh, maybe after this panel, I, I would be grateful. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we will send it to all of you. Uh, okay, we've got one more question. Very short one to me, how actually you shown us the picture of this yellow structure, which was, I don't know, already made, either made by you, it's a strange one. So my question is, do you have any idea what to do with it? Either how to use it or, you know, you, you're, you do the work uh, for people to make it uh, work somehow, yes, to make it functional, so how you see it? Yeah, uh, uh, it doesn't work. Can you hear me? No mic. No mic, but you can hear me. Okay. Uh, okay. No. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes. In, in general, as, as I said, it, it's it's somehow inspired by by open form uh, theory uh, uh, um, from from Oscar uh, Hansen. Uh, so in, in general, I don't want to uh, define it too much to give very specific function to this element, but what I did is uh, it is based on some ergonomical research. What it means that some of elements, mainly those uh, horizontal ones, are in uh, uh, the good height to sit on them uh, just, or you can just jump through them. It's more like the, the something like a playground when I believe that small May, may mainly child will find a way to play play on it. It's more more this uh, way of thinking than than defining completely one function to this uh, to this element. Uh, when I think about this particular animal shaped form. Hi, uh, thank you for all your presentations. I have like a notebook full of comments, questions, and. Uh, uh, thoughts I would like to share with you, but uh, now I would like to uh, engage with Rasa particularly because I was really excited to see your presentation and I was really curious about this, um, if I got it right, was it visual pro procrastination that you mentioned, right? And I was wondering if this is something uh, as a term that you came up with uh, during your practice, maybe I've missed it, or was it, you know, inspired by some readings? And if so, I would be really keen on learning, like, where did it come to you? Where did it occur? Because I think this is an amazing uh, idea for, like, self-regulation practice within uh, or through uh, visual arts, drawing, or other practices. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Well. Uh, the term visual procrastination, I just translated it from that um, exhibition, uh, Scribbling and Doodling from Leonardo da Vinci to Sid Fombley in Rome, uh, but also um, like invented that word because uh, procrastination exists, but the uh, visual one is uh, not so much speaked about. So that's what I was interested in. And in that exhibition, there was an international um, focus on that from a very large uh, scale of um, centuries, how it worked, because in that exhibition uh, behind the sides of the uh, paintings were uh, presented and it became clear to me that uh, these things happened, but nobody spoke about it, nobody looked at it and um, in this case, there is not even so much um, difference between uh, Renaissance artists and modern artists when we see behind the drawings. Maybe the very last question on this session. Actually, I've got another question for Rasa. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed your presentation. We obviously spoke yesterday briefly about this. Um, I find it very interesting. Um, when we spoke yesterday, you said that this doodling, for want of a better word, this visual procrastination, is not something you can do when you're trying to do it, which I thought was really interesting. I mean, what kind of conclusions are, are, are you bringing some of this to bear? Are you making some conclusions about the creative process itself? Do, do we learn something from this about that? 
Yeah, it's, it's hard to make yourself to, to, do, to make those visual procrastinations, but um, um, environment and uh, uh, the, the, the stage where, where I am, like PhD studies, kind of works for that because I have a lot of works to do and I don't want to do them <laughs> immediately. So visual procrastination happens quite naturally and <laughs> my um, notebook is full of that. But if I actually would like to say that uh, I'm mm, making visual procrastination, uh, it wouldn't happen. Like. And is it how creativity happens is sort of what I'm saying. Something uh, that we do by accident when we're supposed to be doing something else. Yeah, but the, this is a question for all my PhD. <laughs> so later maybe I will have an answer. Thank you very much. It was really a wonderful session.